Hi, and welcome to lesson 5 on link architectures. This whole lesson will be dedicated to establishing link level entanglement, and we're going to consider five different architectures. The first three will include both stationary qubits in the form of quantum memories and flying qubits in the form of photons. The fourth architecture will rely only on uh, flying qubits. There will be no memories, while the last fifth architecture will rely only on quantum memories, so stationary qubits without any flying qubits. So let's start with step one and the first architecture called meet in the middle or MIM. So our goal is to establish entanglement between neighboring repeaters in a network. Here we have our repeater one equipped with uh, N quantum memories and repeater two equipped with M quantum memories. So we're not assuming that they both have the same number of quantum memories. They are connected by an optical fiber that serves as our quantum communication channel but also they are connected by classical communication channels, so they're free to exchange classical messages as well. And we want to create entanglement between any number of the memories here in repeater 1 and memories here in repeater 2. And the distance between the two repeaters is given by capital L. So there will be two characteristic timescales that we will care about. The first one is called the communication delay. And that measures how long it takes from a signal from a repeater 1 to reach repeater 2, or vice versa. So it really is just the distance divided by the speed of light in the fiber. And we know from basic optics that the speed of light in fiber is given by the ratio of n divided by c, where n is the refractive index of the fiber material, and c is the speed of light in vacuum. The second time scale is given by the t clock. And this captures how quickly we can reset our memories or detectors. And t clock is given by whichever one is larger. Because it takes a finite amount of time to make a memory emit a photon and then reset it and prepare it for another emission of a photon, similarly, it takes a finite amount of time for a detector to uh, have a detection event and then reset and be prepared to detect another photon. So how does the meet in the middle or MIM also called memory interfer interference memory uh, architecture work. We have two quantum memories in our repeaters and they are both acting as senders, so they are made to emit light. This uh, uh, light travels down uh, the optical fiber towards a BSA or Bell state analyzer where we attempt a Bell state measurement at the two photons arriving from the two quantum memories. Here in the picture we are placing the BSA right in the middle uh, of, the, of the link, but this is not a um, necessity. We can place it at any place we want as long as we compensate and synchronize the emission memory such that the two, two photons arrive at the BSA at the same time. The BSA contains our usual two detector and one beam splitter setup and a coincidence counter. If both of the detectors click, then we know that both photons manage to survive the journey from the uh, memory to the BSA, and we successfully uh, executed a Bell state measurement. Whether this measurement was successful or it failed is communicated back to the senders via the classical channel with a classical message. And the total amount of time for one round is given by T-link, so the time it takes for signal to travel from the sender to BSA and for the classical message to come back, plus the number of time it takes to generate n photons. And once the round is complete, we can attempt the whole process again. So this is the flowchart for the control protocol of the MIM link. We start by uh, initializing our memory count uh, i to be 1, and then we prepare the first memory, we make it emit light. Then we check whether there are any uh, free memories which haven't emitted light yet. And if there are, then we increase the counter, we synchronize with the clock cycle time, and we repeat. So in this loop over here, we are um, making all of our memories at the repeater emit single photons. Once that is done, the memories have to wait. And they are waiting for the classical message from the BSA which is communicated over here, and really it's just a log of which attempts succeeded and which failed. This message does not have to be sent after every attempt, so after every photon arrival, but it can be bundled at the end of after all of the photons are measured out. And then once the memory knows which uh, memories are entangled or not, it can act accordingly. It can consume the entanglement, or if, if it wants, it can keep it for later. 
Then we have to synchronize with our T round time and attempt the whole process again. So here we made two assumptions. One is that the memories are waiting for all the messages from the BSA to arrive. And this is possible when the total amount it, uh, of time it takes to generate and photons is less than T-link. And also we are assuming that at the end of the protocol we are resetting all the memories. In other words, the entanglement is immediately consumed. This may not always be the desirable case, but in particularly if we are trying to do purification, we may want to keep the entanglement after a successful round for later and use only the memories which failed the BSA. But both of these assumptions are not a uh, necessity, they can be relaxed, but then we have to change our pro uh, protocol uh, control a little bit and make it more complex. So how do we measure performance of, uh, of such a link, in fact of any link? There are two useful measures. One is the link utilization factor, and this is the ratio that the memory um, spends idle. It's given by the time it takes to generate n photons compared to the time of the one whole round. So while the memory is active, it's generating photons, but then it needs to wait for the classical message from the BSA um, to arrive. And this is what the utilization factor F quantifies. And another useful metric is the average entanglement distribution rate. And this is given by the average expected number of Bell pairs that we can set up in one round, given by probability P, which is the success um, probability for a Bell state measurement to occur, times N attempts. And we divide it by the total uh, duration of one round. We can also express it in terms of the link utilization factor, as we can see over here. Now the F link utilization factor, the uh, probability of a successful Bell state measurement, and the mm, cycle clock, T clock, is our fundamental properties of the link. They're governed by the distance between the repeaters, as well as the capabilities of the hardware that are, we are using. And because F is uh, a ratio between the time it takes for the uh, photon emission to occur, for N photons, compared to the total uh, time round, it's less than one. So an upper bound on the achievable average rate is given by this ratio over here. We can decompose the probability of a successful Bell state measurement further by considering the probability that each photon arrives from the memory to the BSA, which is given by the following expression, where here it depends on L over 2. So we are assuming that the Bell state, uh, Bell state analyzer is directly in the middle between the two repeaters. And also it depends on the probability of a successful Bell state uh, measurement at the BSA. We know that in linear optics, this is uh, fundamentally limited by P of BSA equal to a half, assuming that the detectors are 100% uh, efficient. So the total probability of success is given by P BSA times P fiber squared, because we require two photons to arrive uh, at the BSA, not just one. And if you want, we can decompose this probability even further by considering the probability of a successful emission and collection of the photon into the fiber. This concludes our discussion of our first architecture, MIM. See you in the next step where we discuss the second architecture.